This morning, we are continuing in a series we started last week on the power we have in praising God. And it's just one series of messages that have been building upon another. We looked at the power of the blood of Jesus Christ around Easter time. Then we looked at the power of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection of Jesus. And we looked at the book of Acts and studied how the Holy Spirit made a difference in people's lives and how the church grew because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives and in their hearts. Well, one thing that we see happening because of the Spirit's presence is that Christians, the church, the, the, the people of Christ, learned to praise God in all circumstances. And they learned the power of praising God. And so this morning, I want to address the subject of the fact that we need to bless God. We're going to be in Psalms, in Psalm 103. So you might want to turn to that, and I'll be referring to it throughout the message. Psalm 103. Now, I want you to understand that quite often we ask for God to bless us, don't we? Or, or we pray, God bless you. Or we sing a song, God bless America. But how often do we turn to God and say, God, how can I bless you? Instead of always being interested in how you are blessing me. Let's bless God. Let's give him the praise that he deserves. This is the second in our series, Power in praising God. Now, some people habitually, which means all the time, talk to themselves. You ever run into someone like that? Maybe some of us are guilty of doing that here. I've got a couple of, of, of uh, cartoons that I happened upon in the last week or so that really confirm the idea of people talking to themselves. The first cartoon I saw showed a man who was walking down a busy city street and he was just one of many people holding their cell phones to their ears. But as we listen to this man's conversation, he's happily proclaiming. He says, this is great. This way I can go block after block talking to myself and no one looks at me like I'm crazy. Another cartoon showed a person who was speaking to his counselor. And he said, talking to myself was okay. Even answering myself was all right. But now I'm even interrupting myself. <laughs> and then there was a third cartoon that showed a boss who was sitting at his desk looking on to uh, an unhappy employee who was filing papers. And the boss says, you may call what you're doing motivational self-talk. I call it muttering under your breath. You know, sometimes we do talk to ourselves, and, and it's not all bad when we do. And in fact, there's an entire psalm where David talked to himself, where David was telling everything within his own body and within his own life to do one thing, and that was to praise the Lord. Psalm 103, the first verse, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. And then he goes on to describe how he was to praise the Lord. We need to listen to King David as he did it. Bless the Lord or praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, praise his holy name. Psalm 103 is a pure song of praise. Now, there's not a single complaint in Psalm 103. There's not a single request in Psalm 103. And if you look at all the different psalms, you find quite often they're filled with anguishing questions. They're filled with requests and pleas to God for help. But, there's, but instead of complaints and instead of requests, Psalm 103 has a joy that builds to a command. We see David is saying, anything with life, anything with breath, needs to praise and bless God. You know, to excite and to inspire godliness in the hearts of others, we have to first stir up godliness in ourselves. If you are a salesperson and you want to be successful in your sales, you've got to be convinced of your product. You've got to use it. You've got to swear by it. You've got to say, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Kalita brought some banana bread in this morning, and I looked at her. I says, that's not sliced. And she turned it sideways. Oh, yes, it is. It's sliced. 
Sliced bread is always better than one chunk, one loaf. And we're convinced of that. We think it's a great idea. We take it for granted because everyone slices bread or it's sliced at the store or it's sliced at the bakery. But think of the times when people just had to pair, tear off a chunk and that's the only way they could eat that loaf of bread. We need to be excited about the product. And the product we are excited about, the product we praise God for, is our salvation through Jesus Christ. We need to stir that godliness up in our own lives. And so this is what Psalm 103 tells us to do. Psalm 103 tells us it's our obligation to bless God. Not to say, God, will you bless me? God, will you bless my family? God, will you bless my friends? God, will you bless the sick? God, will you bless my country? No. God, how can I bless you? How can I offer you praise? Let's first of all understand that praise begins within. Within. It's not something superficial. It's not just because you showed up at a church service at 10 o'clock that somehow praise is going to be uh, oozing into your body. Praise comes from the heart and goes out. David begins his psalm by talking to himself. He's examining his own life. He has discovered a need for genuine introspection. That's a word we don't use very often. He's discovered a need to really look hard at his own heart. And to his dismay, to David's devastation, it appears that he discovers that the beauty of praise and thanksgiving was missing from the very innermost parts of his heart. He said, God, you have done so much for me. How have I thanked you? And so he addresses himself. He speaks to himself. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You know, the soul, that, e e that eternal part of our lives, is, is uh, our total personality. It's the one thing we carry with us into heaven. Our souls are unique. My soul is not like your soul. And your soul is not like anyone else's in this room. We find that having this unique entity in us, this unique being that we are, is something that we keep forever. But David doesn't stop at his soul. He says, bless the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. And then he goes on and he says, and everything in me. Everything in me. He's saying, everything inside me, everything that makes up my body and my soul needs to praise the Lord. He lifts his whole being in gratitude to God. Now, that's pretty powerful, because in verse 2 of Psalm 103, David reminds us not to forget God's benefits. Don't forget those things, he says, that God has done for us. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget his goodness. While he was praising God from the innermost parts of his heart, he was not overlooking specifics. Specifics, not pacifics, specifics of God's unmerited favor and God's mercy. That's what grace is. Grace, something we don't deserve, something that God continues to give us. And he was observing that, even though David knew that he could not remember all of God's blessings in his life, he knew he must not forget them. God, you have done more for me than I can even count. In other words, he was not to take for granted God's goodness. And he was overwhelmed with joy. If David did not take for granted God's goodness, the big question for us to consider is, do we take for granted God's goodness? How many times has he blessed you already this morning? From the moment you first woke up, how many times has he blessed you? You just breathed in some air and you just exhaled. That was a blessing from God. All the other things that have brought you to this point and to this place and to, to worship with these people have been blessings from God. Did anyone's car break down this morning on the way to church? No one? What a blessing. Did you have food to eat this morning even if you skipped breakfast because you counted on the coffee being here? God's blessed you. And we need to realize the, 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 the mundane, the ordinary, the simple things that he blesses the entire world with, he blesses us with. 
But on top of that, he gives us a reason to rejoice and a reason to thank him for that. So let's understand praise begins within. Secondly, praise comes from every aspect of our lives. I want you to look at me verse by verse at Psalm 103. We need to praise God because he pardons our sins. That's what verse 3 says. We offer him praise. We give him blessings because he forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. We need to praise God because he is that great physician who heals us. Not only our physical healing that we need, but he heals us emotionally and spiritually. In verse 4, we praise God because he is our redeemer. He redeems our life from the pit and crowns us with love and with compassion. We need to praise him because he is our benefactor. Now that's, a, that's another big word we don't use very often. But basically, he looks out for us and takes care of us. He watches over our needs and makes sure that, that what we need is met. Verse 5 says, You have satisfied our desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. Does that sound familiar? How many know by heart Isaiah 40? Those who wait upon the Lord will what? They will renew their strength and they will do what? They will fly on wings like eagles. Here's David saying the same thing. God, you have been so good to us. You have given us so much. You satisfy us in such a way that we can't even express. Skipping down or going to verse 6, we have to praise him because he is our judge. He keeps us on the straight and narrow. He points us down the right road. Verse 6 says, uh, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He makes sure that we're cared for. And he makes sure that we receive what we need. He executes righteousness. In skipping down to verse 9, he chastises us. He offers discipline. Should we thank God for discipline? I hope so. If you had godly parents when you grew up, if you're trying to be a godly parent to your own child today, don't you think there needs to be some thanksgiving for the desire to steer someone straight? To put them on the right track. And verse 9 says, He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. But he chastises us when we need that kind of direction and that kind of correction. And so even when David was corrected or disciplined for wrongdoing, he recognized God's hand in that. In verse 11, we need to praise him for blessing, uh, uh, for blessing, uh, I, sh I should say, uh, his height for who he is. Verse 11 says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And that's a godly fear, folks. That's not a frightened fear. That's a reverent fear, full of awe. We talk about things being awesome. And that word becomes very lighthearted when we say it. But when we talk about the awesomeness of God, when we talk about how high he is, when we talk about how much he loves us, we understand that his mercy cannot be comprehended. We are in awe of him and who he is and what he does. As high as the heavens are above the earth, your love is that great for us. Uh, even with the Hubble telescope. We cannot see into the very far reaches of the universe. We can see further than, than mankind has ever seen before, but we're only seeing a glimpse of what God has created. And he's there. He's done it. And he continues. In verse 12, we need to praise him for his breadth. So we're praising him for his height. But verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our sins from us. You've heard that verse how many times in your life? There it is. Remember where it is. Psalm 103, verse 12. We praise him for the height, but we praise him for the width, because when God throws our sins away, they are thrown away. And they don't have to come back and haunt us ever again. Forgiveness from God cannot be rescinded. He cannot pull it back. He gives it as we follow him. We celebrate the fact 
that there's a breadth, a breadth, B-R-E-A-D-T-H, a breadth in his love. We need to praise him for his depth. So we've praised him for his height. We've praised him for his width. And verse 13 says, as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who serve him. Oh, the deep love of God. That deep love that surrounds us and holds us up and instills in us faith and hope and love as a father pities those who fear him. God's compassion, God's care for us cannot be counted. We can't measure it. It's beyond our comprehension. In verse 14, we praise God for him being creator. Verse 14, he knows how we are formed and he remembers that we are dust. Consider that, folks. Consider the joy of recognizing that even in the creation account, God created all things, but when it came to man, he made him from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed his living soul into him. God knows our frame. He knows who we are better than we know ourselves. He is our creator. And we need to praise him because he keeps his promises. That's what verses 17 and 18 say. It says, um, skip, skipping over here, the next, my next page. It says, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. From everlasting to everlasting, okay, from before the beginning of time, throughout all eternity. From everlasting. To everlasting, God's mercy is given to us. He keeps his promises. He is faithful. And in verse 19, David says that we need to praise him because he is our king. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. King of kings, Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. God's kingdom rules over all. So we praise him with all that is within us. We praise him for all his benefits. We praise him because uh, he has made us. We praise him because we have come from him. We praise him because we are his people. We praise him because this is his pasture and he makes sure that his sheep are fed. We praise him when we enter his gates and his courts. We praise him for the name that is above every other name, and that is the name of Jesus. We praise him for his mercy. We praise him for his truth to all generations. We praise him because he has brought us out of a miry pit, out of a mud bog, and out of quicksand, and he has cleaned us up and set us on dry ground. We praise him because it is by his grace that we are saved. We praise him because he sent his son to die for our sins and to give us the tree of life that we can eat forever. We praise him because we got up this morning. We praise him because he brought us to this house of praise. We praise him for the gift of his dear son, Jesus Christ, who suffered, who bled, who died, and who brought the promise of resurrection into our lives that we can all have eternal life. So no matter what's going on, no matter how difficult your day might seem, there is no reason to say, I cannot praise God. There is no reason to say, I have nothing to hope for. God is the one who opens the door. God is the one that allows us to enter his presence. Do you remember the story of Job, who was afflicted by the devil? And in his affliction, he had a skin disease that was causing horrible, horrible sores. And the only relief Job could have from those sores back in those early uh, cannibalistic, almost, medical days was for him to take a section of pottery, a broken pot, scrape the sores off of his body, take some ashes, and put in the wound. That's horrible. But even as Job was doing that, he was saying this, Naked came I into the world, and naked I shall leave it. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
even in the worst of situations, we can praise God in every aspect of our lives. Finally, we need to understand that praise possesses some very unique qualities. Today, if you find something to praise God for, will you do it? Or will you take it for granted? In the book of Psalms, in this one book in the Old Testament, there are many words of encouragement. And this one book of the Old Testament contains over 43,000 words. It contains 2,027 verses of history. It contains 164 questions that are asked and answered. We're not left hanging. The book of Psalms contains 413 commands given by God. The book of Psalms relays and reminds us of 338 different acts of God. This book has 124 righteous and devout vows made to God. There are 174 statements of praise. Now, in the book of Psalms, there are 118 complaints. You know, God's big enough to let us complain. But all the complaints in the book of Psalms also list a remedy, a solution. God does not leave us hanging. There are 865 facts about who God is. There are 235 statements about God's Word and how precious the Bible is. There are 182 different testimonies of how God had worked in people's lives. There are 97 promises that God will always keep. And there are 128 facts about the coming of the Messiah, who we know as Jesus Christ. Now, above all things, above all things, we need to praise God. Why? Because we were created to praise God. What should praise mean to a child of God? If we were born into that family and then purchased by the blood of Jesus and adopted into that family, what does praise mean to those of us who belong to Jesus? It means that praise is the very lifeblood of the saints. It's what courses through our veins. Praise is the experience of being in tune with God. If we are out of touch with God, if we are out of a relationship with God, we probably are not praising Him. But if we are in tune with Him, oh, the joy. We're doing what we were intended and made to do. Praise brings us closer to tearing down a barrier that we often surround ourselves with that we call selfishness. Because praise builds a fellowship with God. Our life is not just about us and what we want and where we want to go and how we want to grow and what we want to achieve and how much money we want to make and who we want to marry and on and on and on. It's not about us individually. It's about our relationship, walking, talking, living, breathing with God. Now, we've taught our kids a little tune, a little Sunday school tune that says the blessings come down when the prayers go up. And I bet a lot of you are remembering that tune. But our praise creates a spirituality that is charged with intimacy. Our prayers go up and God says, I'm, I'm here, I hear you, I'm your father, I'm your daddy, your Abba, and I'm going to take care of you. Let's just do this together. And that's what we do. That's what we do. Praise will change our attitudes, and God will get the glory. Praise will drive out demonic forces that otherwise would destroy us. Praise brings a church into one accord, and that's not a Honda, by the way. I wanted to see if you were listening. Praise brings a church into unity and gives us thanksgiving and joy. Our praise brings us into the light of God's presence without any delay. When we start praising God, God says, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm, I, I will be your helper. I will help you figure this out and sort it out. When we lift our praise to him and our minds are stayed upon him, focused on him, there's something about that that lifts our hopes and gives us joy and peace. Our praise to God provides substance 
to any hope that we have. Because we look to the hills from which comes our help. Sometimes our help isn't here. It's not, it doesn't seem to be present. But we believe. And God is coming. And he will fill us where we have those voids in those empty spots. Now some Christians find it difficult to think about the privilege of prayer without doing so in terms of asking for something or complaining to God about some life-threatening situation or some circumstance that they're in. And of course, the Bible is clear that we need to lay our needs before God. In fact, the Bible encourages us to lay our needs before God. We're exhorted to do that in so many places. But we see James even saying, you have not because you ask not. So there's nothing wrong with petitioning God. There's nothing wrong with bringing him our burdens. We see that through the book of, of, of Psalms as well. However, the word of God really talks to believers and tells them to praise the Lord, to express their gratitude more often than it tells us to ask God for things. Why should we express praise and thanksgiving to God? Well, when we cultivate the habit of praising God, we actually grow our ability to appreciate the greatness of God and His glory. The more we praise God, the more we see Him at work in our lives. We diminish our own self-centeredness. Self gets set, set aside. The barrier that we put up around ourselves starts to tear down. In short, we grow up. We grow up spiritually. And this is evidence when we find ourselves able to focus on faith and on praise rather than on want or need or complaint. Yes, there's room to complain to God. Yes, there's room to cry to Him. Yes, there's room to ask Him for our needs. But there has to be thanksgiving and joy. The Lord's Prayer starts with praise before it ever goes into the idea of giving us our daily bread, forgiving our sins. And then the Lord's Prayer ends with praise. There's more praise in the Lord's Prayer than our requests. That needs to be the attitude of our heart. There are people who cannot bless God at all. Really, there are. Why? Why cannot some people bless God? Because their sin is burdening them and is weighing them down. Sin weighs them down. Sin leads to death. And only one person ever in the history of the world can destroy sin. Only one person can replace death with life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. He said, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's God's business. That's what he does for us. And until we let Jesus change us from the inside out, not superficially, but from the heart, we cannot honestly proclaim, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God wants to come into your life. He wants to come into your heart. And he does it, he's accomplished it through Jesus Christ. Through his sacrifice on the cross, through his dying for your sins and for my sins and taking them away, for him beating the fear of death in the grave and resurrecting eternally, God wants us to proclaim, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We invite you to come to Christ. We invite you to accept him as Lord and Savior. We invite you to identify with him in baptism through the significance of death and burial and resurrection, remembering what Jesus has done for us, and you would be committing your life to him. We invite you because Jesus invites you. Let's bless God. Let's bless him with all that we are, all that we have, 
all that we ever will be. And if you're ready to make that kind of decision, I invite you to come while we stand and sing and meet me up here, and we will introduce you to Jesus Christ. Let's stand together.